Let's mold in the Central Committee. Let's cringe in the Central Committee. Let's bog in the Central Committee right now. The French Empire was one of the most powerful in human history. At its height, it controlled almost 10% of the world's land area. From Southeast Asia to West Africa, the country we today associate with baguettes and cinema was a dominant global power. All right, let's check this and that out. was particularly true in Africa. France oversaw territory spanning 17 modern day nations from Morocco to the Congo. Under the banner of a civilizing mission, France oversaw brutal occupations that engorged the wealth of the empire and left a terrible legacy for ordinary Africans, marked by slavery, extraction, and murder. And today, France's empire in Africa is still around, in a streamlined, more profitable, and even more exploitative form. Let me explain. Pretty crazy. In the aftermath of the Second World War, Reject. there was a wave of decolonial movements sweeping across Africa and Asia. And the French, humiliated by their defeat and occupation at the hands of the Nazis, were eager to maintain their empire. So they responded to revolts in Algeria, Indochina, and Madagascar with brutal reprisals. Maintaining foreign holdings became increasingly difficult. By 1960, France was forced to grant independence to almost all its colonies. But something really important happened in Africa. Basically, the leadership of France decided to keep their empire in Western and Central Africa intact in everything but name. The plan was simple. When an African country gained its independence, it was made to sign a so-called cooperation agreement with France, which would outline the nature of their relations moving forward. In exchange for French foreign aid, African countries were required to give France rights over natural resources. Oh, now Chad, do you think the aid was greater than or less than the value of the natural resources France was extracting? What do you think? What do you think? France to maintain troops in their territory indefinitely and, most importantly, keep these countries' currencies linked to France's currency, the franc. Instead of having their own currency, they were to use the franc of the financial community of Africa, what is now called the CFA franc. The French framed these cooperation agreements as a choice, but they were also clear about the consequences of defiance. When the leader of Guinea, a socialist named Sekou Touré, rejected the cooperation agreement with France and declared that he preferred to be poor in freedom than rich in slavery, the French government decided to make an example of him. They cut all foreign aid to Guinea and did everything they could to destabilize the government. They launched a secret campaign to print fake Guinean banknotes and flood the country with them. One French spy later bragged, the operation was a total success. Guinea's economy, already very weak, never fully recovered. The French said that these countries existed within the so-called French community, but wow. the policy would come to be known more widely as France Afrique. It was about having the former colonies in a position that was maximally advantageous to French interests. Many of the first generation of post-colonial leaders in former French colonies had essentially been installed by the French. They spoke French, had spent time in France, and were well integrated with French elites. Jacques Foucault, a French diplomat, oversaw French relations with Africa for almost 30 years and built a huge web of client relationships with African leaders, using corruption and covert operations to make them loyal subordinates. When local political orders were threatened, the French weren't afraid to protect their hand-picked dictators. Since 1960, France has invaded Africa more than 50 times. Look at the Central African country of Gabon as one example. Gabon is particularly important to France because it has a huge supply of oil and an even bigger supply of uranium. Now, now chat. You have these countries in Africa absolutely gushing with resources, and yet they remain poor. I wonder why that is. Now, what, what liberals want you to think and is that it's because there's just something about Africans. And they're going to leave that undefined because they don't, you know, it's uncomfortable for them to, to actually make the conservative argument. Now, conservatives outright say it. It's because they're inferior. That's what conservatives say. Liberals want you to think that, but think it's impolite. But the reality is, African nations are undeveloped and racked with corruption because that's the tool that the West uses to exploit them. Among the African colonies, Gabon was historically one of the very closest to France. 
1967, a man named Omar Bongo became Gabon's president, soon turning the country into a one-party dictatorship. And Bongo was intimate with France. He had been appointed after flying to Paris for what was basically a job interview with the president. So under Bongo, France and Gabon enjoyed a relationship that benefited both sets of elites. Gabon's oil was pumped by the French state-owned oil company ELF, and its uranium went right into France's arsenal of nuclear weapons. In return, France subsidized Gabon's budget, especially the parts that flowed into the pockets of Omar Bongo and his family. Exactly. At one point, Bongo was worth over $130 million. Gabon, meanwhile, remained poor and underdeveloped. Under Bongo, it had one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world. Instead of investing in the Gabonese economy, Bongo spent state funds on influencing French politics in his favor, bankrolling the campaigns of central future French presidents. Even today, France keeps troops in the country to support Gabon's current ruler, who happens to be Omar Bongo's son. Oh, and what? somehow, Gabon is Shock. actually one of the happier stories. Other countries, Shock like the Central Shock. African Republic, are today some of the poorest in the world, in part due to the legacies of French-backed dictators like Jean Bédel Bokassa. But there's another aspect of French influence that's even more important. Probably the most central part of all is the CFA franc, the last colonial currency still in widespread use. In practice, the countries that use the CFA franc have virtually no monetary sovereignty. The value of their currency is linked to the euro. The poorest countries in the world have a currency controlled by the richest countries. And so the imperatives of European and countries... And by the way, chat, okay, so obviously... All the monetarists out there, all the right-wingers, you know, hey, they have a currency that's pegged to the euro, which is basically means they can't, discipline and they can't deploy inflation against creditors, okay? They can't, they can't lower, devalue their currency in order to incentivize foreign investment. It, this is basically Greece, Italy, Spain on a massively more intense scale. This is madness. This is madness. <laughs> My God, dude. Inflation end up shaping the very different world of Western and Central Africa. That leads to an overly tight approach to credit, something that's necessary in our current system for an economy to grow. It means that any appreciation in the euro makes exports from these countries less price competitive. So just look at what happened in Senegal. When the euro appreciated against the dollar from 2000 to 2009, the value of the CFA franc got higher. But this made local Senegalese rice more expensive than imported rice from Thailand. So Senegal, which was trying to build its own domestic rice industry, instead saw Thai rice wipe out local rice farmers. So because domestic products are expensive, this makes export-driven growth nearly impossible, which is necessary to lead a country out of poverty. That's why most countries that use a CFA franc have growth rates significantly lower than their neighbors. So in other words, a strong currency for, a, for these countries that they, so lack of monetary control has led in large part to less, less growth. Conservatism proven wrong again. Because the CFA discourages the development of domestic industry, many of these economies have actually been shrinking. And actually, that's really important. This is actually a really important point. Uh, um, this is exactly what Europe wants. This is the dark side of, uh, of how the world works, is basically European countries don't have the natural resources. So what do they do? They make their economy from value add. What does that mean? It means they produce finished products. Like when you take raw resources and turn it into a, a washing machine as an example, or a car. That requires a lot of capital investment. That requires a trained workforce, all this, all this good stuff. But the reality is, is that if you take that money and you put it in a lower wage country, you invest in the same amount of capital, those goods could be produced at a lower cost, obviously with greater exploitation of the worker, right? And with lower transportation costs, like if, and this is something for how the United States of America developed, right? Like, why was Pittsburgh a big city? Because it had the Allegheny, the Monongahela, and the Ohio rivers. It was close to iron deposits, and it was close to some of the best coal in the world, anthracite, from the hills 
and mountains of Pennsylvania. So you could float them down on coal barges and then transport the steel through much of the country by going through the Ohio, which then leads in the Mississippi. So Pennsylvania, so Pittsburgh in particular, and then you could take that steel and export it out of uh, New Orleans and take it anywhere you want in the world. But the point is that these uh, geographical advantages gave Pittsburgh an edge in producing steel, right? That makes sense. You want to be near rivers or, you know, because they are the most efficient way to transport a lot of bulk goods, right? So why do we have steel all the way across the fucking world now? Well, that's because of the labor rates are so much lower. So we've de-industrialized much of the United States, but we still have, uh, we could afford to do that because we have something known as a petrodollar. Going back to my original point, this is by design. They don't want these African nations who have the resources right at hand to develop industry, domestic industry, because that would be a direct competition, competition to French goods. This is neo-mercantilism, basically. The idea that the colony produces raw resources and it, and it buys, with its raw resources, finished goods from the colonizing country. That is what's happening here. That is what France is doing to Africa. Many of these economies have actually been shrinking. The Ivory Coast, the largest CFA franc country, has a real GDP per capita one third lower than it had in 1978. Other CFA franc countries like Cameroon and the Republic of the Congo reached their highest levels of real GDP per capita in the 70s and 80s. And because economic growth is weaker, there's more incentive for local elites in these countries, always tied closely to French multinationals, to take as much money out as possible. Billions of dollars have flooded out of these countries and into shell corporations and foreign bank accounts. This is part of why this is part of why there's actually not much interest in going after Putin's money. Because the moment you start to expose the Putin and the Chinese oligarchs who have raided and stolen from their country, suddenly you're exposing Saudi Arabian oligarchs. Suddenly you're support, uh, exposing all of the dirty deals between Europe and di the worst dictators in the poorest countries in the world. So you need to have banking uh, 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 privacy, banking security, in order to cover up the West's not just complicity, but active creation of these systems of exploitation to serve Western capitalists. And then, you know, we have some of the more overt stuff, like the IMF and U.S. military hegemony. That's why do, you, why do you think there's a war in Ukraine right now? Because the United States of America was trying to use the same kind of models on Ukraine by getting them in hawk to IMF loans and then forcing what are known as structural adjustments, neoliberalism, so privatized services, privatized state-run corporations, cut labor laws, cut the minimum wage, cut government spending and services to make Ukrainian assets ripe for foreign exploitation and investment, meaning ownership, foreign ownership. Through massive corruption, these are in paradise and watch the, the Thank you both for the uh, subs. It's so in 2007, long. for example, Omar Bongo's daughter-in-law appeared on VH1 to buy an LA mansion for $25 million. And elites in France get a great deal too. They enjoy cheap access to natural resources He's and kickbacks right. from shady business deals. A French billionaire named Vincent Bolloré now owns most of the major ports across West Africa. In France, Bolloré is known as the, quote, king of Africa. So French colonialism in Africa has never really ended. This is why academics use the term neo-colonialism. Even as the branding of like empire has faded away, That's, uh, the no structures of that. economic extraction have only like grown stronger. Us. This neocolonialism is actually a much more efficient form of exploitation than the colonialism of the past. The French no longer pretend to care about building functional governments or improving local living standards. It's pure extraction all the time. So these African countries are not underdeveloped, they're overexploited. France is almost totally reliant on its influence in Africa for its economic power. In the words of Italy's foreign minister, 
if France didn't have its African colonies. Uh, Janine fucking Inez took out a long-term IMF loan as interim leader in Bolivia. Imagine having a banker make you sign a loan with a barrel of an AK in your throat. Well, not only that, I, I, I mean, Bolivia is an example of a country that didn't do it. The reason why they hated uh, the Bolivian movement towards socialism is not only did they say fuck you to the IMF, they proved that was the right thing to do. They had the fastest growing country in Latin America was the IMF free Bolivia under Evo Morales. And they built their economy in a broad based way with growth at the bottom of the income distribution leading the way. Bolivia is actual proof of exactly what we're saying. There, and it's not even a doubt. There's no doubt about it. There's the, and the, so the claim with, with Bolivia is never that they're misgoverning for the benefit of the economy or the people. It's he got rid of term limits. A, a Supreme Court decision by independently elected judges declared uh, term limits unconstitutional under the Bolivian Constitution. We have no say in that! Who gives a shit? And then he won the election. He won the votes. But they want those resources back in our hands. As, as Elon Musk said, we can coup wherever we want. Hey, Mike, I'm literally running while doing my errand so I can save a bit of gas. So thanks for entertaining me. You're welcome, bud. It's because that's what they should be called. It would be the 15th largest world economy. Instead, it's among the first, exactly because of what it's doing in Africa. And the French know this. Francois Mitterrand, former president of France, said it himself. Without Africa, he declared, France will have no history in the 21st century. Today, of course, France faces competition from China within Africa and new challenges to the colonial symbolism of the CFA franc. There are plans to change the currency's name and abandon the most overt symbols of the colonial past to make it look like the system is more African than French. And that is the, that is the next step of neoliberalism. Colonialism, but woke. And here's the thing, chat. Like, talk about, let's, let's talk about somebody. I'll call someone out, for example, oh, Dylan Burns. Dylan Burns will never talk about shit like this. Oh, he's a foreign policy guy, but he'll never talk about stuff like this. Now that I've said his name, he'll, he will uh, to save face. But this is how the global system works and why, why people like uh, everybody who got the, the coup in Bolivia wrong, you should never listen to ever, ever, ever. Because Bolivia proves exactly this point, is that the systems of international control, the IMF, the CFA franc. They serve as a way to set these countries into a, a state of permanent corruption and exploitation. And one of the things that will happen is when you talk about African development, people will try to point the finger at Africans as if it's their fault their government is being propped up by what amounts to a military superpower. The evil, corrupt dictator is being propped up by the French military. What the fuck are you supposed to do about that? And even if you succeed at kicking them out, France will use its position in the international capitalist system to beat you down, to sanction you, to send in covert ops. As we said earlier in this, they sent in... They sent in counterfeit money and dumped it into that domestic economy. How do, you, how do you grow? How do you build an economy if one of the most developed countries in the world is sending in spies to dump counterfeit cash into your economy? There's just no way to counter that. It's not possible. You're all pointing all this out to draw attention away from the Ukrainian conflict. It's literally of what about... Yeah, I know. <laughs> but France has no intention of actually abandoning a system... Thank you, Grab. That's a really good link. We'll watch it next. Richest nations on Earth. The real question is whether the next generation of Africans will allow it to continue. Just look at how Westerns talk about African countries taking loans from China. They say they're too stupid to know what's best for them, barely trying to hide their racism. The reason why so many liberals hate the Belt and Road Initiative is because it causes competition in Africa. 
China is not going to Africa to benefit Africans, okay? China is going to Africa because they want to secure resources for their country and their own growth. But now France and Western countries have competition in Africa. Now when Burkina Faso or the Ivory Coast or wherever wants to get foreign aid and development money, China is there to put in a bid. France doesn't like that. The United States doesn't like that. That means they're going to have to give more money. Now, in those domestic politics, it isn't just going to be a one-party state that's oriented toward France. There might be populations and groups of people who say, hey, we should take that terrible IMF loan. We should take that better Chinese loan. We shouldn't take that terrible French development deal. We should take that Chinese development deal. And now suddenly there's Chinese spies in those countries trying to counteract the French spies. That's what they fucking hate. That's the reality, by the way. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to say China's uh, doing it for altruistic reasons. They're not. But now there's competition. Now there's a bid. Can't have that. Now it's the Belt and Road Initiative. It's China authoritarianism expanding. These countries have one-party states imposed by military dictatorships with French troops. What are you talking about? I miss my Lutfi for the Gravel Institute. Absolutely banger video. One of the best I've ever seen and desperately needed. I fucking love Gravel Institute. Anybody who criticizes Gravel Institute is dog shit. It's also massive projection. They assume China is just there, there to fuck over. Uh, by the way, Chad, we really, really need you to go and like this. It's criminally underviewed, Chad. This is criminally underviewed. Every American should have to see this shit. There's also mass rejection. They assume that China is there to just fuck over Africa as opposed to help decolonize process the cost of natural resources. Like if I want a hospital and I use our cobalt mines is way better than just having roads from the mines no. to the ports. Exactly. Exactly. Mexicami nine. Thanks for the six months. Free market means you're free to commit genocide. Free market means we install in, uh, corrupt dictators to steal your natural resources. Africa is a rich continent. Its people should be living like fucking kings and queens and not under the boots of these petty dictators. We're watching some uh, Parenti. But that, that expropriation of the third world has been going on for 400 years brings us to another revelation, namely that the third world is not poor. You don't go to poor countries to make money. There are very few poor countries in this world. Most countries are rich. The Philippines are rich. Brazil is rich. Mexico is rich. Chile is rich. Only the people are poor. But there's billions to be made there to be carved out and to be taken. There's been billions for 400 years. The capitalist European and North American powers have carved out and taken the timber, the flax, the hemp, the cocoa, the rum, the tin, the copper, the iron, the rubber, the bauxite, the slaves, and the cheap labor. They have taken out of these countries. These countries are not underdeveloped, they're overexploited. <laughs> And not only that, just to give you an, an idea, Chad, about how rich most of the developing countries in the world are. In, uh, in, in Peru, there was a mountain, completely silver ore. And it was, uh, here it is, I found it. Sarah, uh, Sarah Rico. Simply, uh, it is estimated that 85% of the silver produced in the Central Andes, this is the Bolivian city, excuse me, I said Peru. 85% of silver produced in the Central Andes mountains during the time came from Cerro Rico. Basically, it's called Rich Mountain! Where do you think the wealth of Spain and Europe came from? 
85% of silver came out of this fucking mountain. The explo uh, extraction of mineral ores began in 1545 by the Spanish Empire. Between the 16th and 18th century, 80% of the world's silver supply came out of this mine. Yet Bolivia was one of the co poorest countries in the world? Until a socialist was elected! That's weird, isn't it? Isn't that odd? Isn't that odd? And that's by the way, Chad, just in case you want to know. Same thing with Brazil. Brazil is poor as fuck. When Parenti, you saw that video clip of Parenti talking about overexploitation. Brazil was poor as fuck until a socialist was elected. Lula! Who led to an incredible growth in their economy. And now they're rapidly approaching developed country status. That is the actual fucking reality. He's going to win again, by the way. In case you want some hopium, 